Well, I'm Dennis Cooks uh, here at the Wilson Center working uh, with Bob on South Asia. Uh, I'm very delighted to have this opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon's session, Ambassador Jawad, who is Afghanistan's or the representative of the new Afghanistan in Washington. And in a very real sense, he is a representative of the new Afghanistan. If you look at his uh, biography, uh, he left his, left his country, like many of his compatriots, as a refugee at the end of the 1970s, I think in 1980. Uh, he then, oh, he had studied in Afghanistan in a French lycée. He parle bien français. And then he went to, for further studies, he had become a lawyer, I believe, in Afghanistan. He went to Germany, and er spricht sehr gut Deutsch. Uh, and then he came to the U.S. of A. And he ended up living in California and be was a practicing attorney, I believe, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and after the events of 9-11, he returned home and he became a, a uh, worked very closely with President Karzai, first as his press secretary and then as his chief of staff and was also in charge of dealing with international relations in the presidency. And in addition, uh, as an attorney uh, with a legal background, he had a very large role to play in pulling together uh, the new constitution. And he was the link between the presidency and the Constitutional Commission. Uh, Ambassador Jawad uh, came here just last November, I believe. Uh, we were with a group uh, on our way out to visit Afghanistan, so we had the, the privilege of meeting with him and consulting with him before the trip, and um, was tremendously impressed with him at the time, and understand he's doing an excellent job here, uh, and uh, look forward to his remarks this afternoon on the political situation, the Constitution, and so forth. Of course, if we have to ask him which language he's going to speak in. <laughs> but I think maybe he ought to speak in English. So, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Cox. It's a pleasure to be here. I really, I prepared a speech on the Afghan Constitution. I, but I think I'm not going to read this. Reading speeches are boring. So if you, if you want to, if you want a copy of it, my staff will have it. Let's have uh, frank discussions about what's going on in Afghanistan, what we are up to, what we've accomplished, and what's ahead of us. But before I do this, I would like to thank uh, uh, all the distinguished fellows that are here. It's an honor to be among some of the best Afghan scholars here. Uh, Professor Mali is here, and so is Professor Barfield and others. That's, uh, it's a pleasure to be among such a distinguished group of people. And I would like to, to thank uh, Woodrow Wilson Center for, for organizing this event. I'd like to talk uh, about the Afghan new constitution mainly, and, but also would like to talk about some of the achievement of the Afghan government and also the challenges that we are facing. In the past two years, we have uh, sustained the policy of, uh, of building national institutions in Afghanistan and continue to craft inclusive political processes. This is a difficult exercise in Afghanistan, and sometime the focus being maintaining stability in Afghanistan, we fell short of delivering justice, and fell short of, of delivering all the expectations that the people of Afghanistan had from us. But we thought, unless we have a stable Afghanistan, unless we maintain the stability in Afghanistan, we were not gonna be able to deliver on any other promises that we have made to the people. Um, on January 4th, President Karzai signed the new constitution into law. A group of, uh, initially a group of six people and then later about a group of close to 30 people actually worked on the initial draft of the constitution with the consultation of some international experts, including experts from, from France, Professor Carcasson, and uh, from the United States, uh, from South Africa, even one of the distinguished experts of constitutional law from South Africa helped us. For me, it was a very interesting exercise, being, being trained in here 
in a uh, legal system in the U.S. and other. When we started, we thought that we will draft a constitution with more or less a minimalist approach to just cover the, really the basic principles that's needed to guide <laughs> Afghanistan for the next 50 years. But once we have started the process, and particularly after talking with some experts from South Africa, we realized that for us the most important measure is to make the transition. If you, make, if you don't make the transition in the next two, three years, there will, there will not be a 50 years down the road for us. So the constitution that initially I was thinking that, that would have had something like 70 articles turned out to be a constitution with 176 articles altogether. It includes a lot of measures that you don't see in, a, in other constitutions. And the reason for that is that while we are working on the Constitution, while we are drafting the Constitution, we had the luxury of, of having access to some of the best experts available internationally. That was one reason that, that the Constitution goes into a lot of details that otherwise look unnecessary. And then the other thing is that in most other countries that are not in post-conflict situation, the enabling laws, the secondary laws in place, so if you cover the, ba the basic, the principles on, in the Constitution, then you're fine. But in our case, those, those, the enabling lo laws are either non-existent or outdated. So we, we put a lot of fresh, you put a lot of articles in the Constitution that, that generally when you read it, you, you wonder why it's there. Is this a constitutional matter? Sometimes, no, it's not. But, but it's needed to provide for a smooth transition. <coughs> And the, con the Constitution of Afghanistan is a balanced charter. It's not the best Constitution ever written. We didn't want it. The best Constitution ever written is the Constitution of Soviet Union <laughs> that provides for heaven on earth. So. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we, 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 didn't, we couldn't afford that. Uh, so we, we were, uh, we were uh, practical, we were pragmatic. It, it seeks balance in many areas. It seeks a balance between a strong presidential system and a, parliament, a parliamentary system and the wishes of the locals to run their local affairs. Why a strong presidential system in Afghanistan? Because we need to build the national institutions in Afghanistan. Unless the national institutions are built in Afghanistan, there will be no future for Afghanistan. There will be a lot of discussion about respecting the rights and the volitions of, of, of provinces to run their local affairs. This is very legitimate. This is the only way to create dem democracy, in a, uh, democracy in a society. But the fact is that, that people who claim to represent people on the provinces, on the countryside, are, are people who've imposed their, their rule by gun. The traditional institution of Afghanistan that provided for traditional leadership are gone through war and, vi and violence. So it, is, it was a very delicate exercise. You really cannot build a democracy unless you provide equal chance, unless you unless you provide for a strong uh, parliamentary system. Well, but you can imagine the, things, the way things are going right now, that the next parliament of Afghanistan, the election are scheduled for, for September, will be filled with a lot of elements that you and I will not, don't want to see as part of the building democratic process in Afghanistan. I'm afraid that the parliament might be filled with drug barons, warlords, and alike. Why? Because because we can issue a decree authorizing the formation of political party even if you've done so, but you cannot create a political party by a decree. This is a culture that takes time. Political parties based on national vision takes a lot of time in Afghanistan. So while we understood the importance of the parliamentary system, we had to keep it under control to the extent possible because realistically, we can imagine what kind of parliament it's gonna be. Of course, same concerns uh, was, 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 are also right about the president. What if, if a dictator, what if someone take power with? So that's why a balance should have been reached to provide for, 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 a, for a strong presidency, but also for a parliament with extensive power of inquiry. The president cannot dissolve the parliament, for instance, and the president can be impeached. There's a procedure on how the other parliament can impeach the president. The second balance that we were trying to reach was how to respect and maintain the traditional and social values of Afghanistan, being a traditional society, being a country in active and forefront of war against terrorism, extremism, and Al-Qaeda, and therefore its, its Islamist credential always under question by its enemy, how to keep the, the good traditional values of Afghanistan, but yet keep a forward-looking position, keep 
take Afghanistan where we want to take Afghanistan. That was the second balance that we had to reach, and very, very important one for us. So basically, the, the parliament right now can, um, consists, the, that provides that 25, uh, almost 25 percent of the lower house will be, actually more than 25 percent now, of, of lower house will be, will, will consist of, of women delegates. Right now we have 64, uh, we have 34 provinces in Afghanistan. In each province has to send two women delegates to the, to the lower house. At the Senate level, the president appoints one third of the, of the delegates and from that one third, half must be women. This is a very high quota actually for Afghan, for any country, for Islamic or non-Islamic. It's, it's much higher than, than, than the quota here in Washington. Uh, so, uh, and again, this is not to this is not to 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 please someone because we know it really doesn't mean much if you have the best decree on the book that provides for for for, for uh, that uh, equal rights for women. It has to be implemented. That's why we put a lot of emphasis on on education. That's why we have we put a lot of emphasis on on building national institutions. Um, but the reason that, that we are also pushing strongly, or the government is pushing strongly to the extent possible for women's rights is because I was in, in, in a Kabul during the Loya Jirga. Afghan, Afghan women were the most liberal, the most constructive block of vote available. They were not divided on ethnic issues because they were the prime victim of war and violence. So they knew what it means if Afghanistan go back to the days of war and violence and anarchy. It, so to build a, a, a civil society in Afghanistan, it's important to push for women's rights. And, and, and that's why you see that the fundamentalists uh, fundamentalist and extremists in Afghanistan are very afraid of any improvement in the women's rights because they, they see this as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a direct threat. One of the achievements of the, of the Constitution that sometimes is overlooked is that it prohibits formation of political parties based on, uh, on ethnicity in uh, Islamic school of thought. This is, this is common in, in, in our neighborhood in, in Afghanistan and in neighboring countries. And if, again, if this has to be implemented, and in order to implement that, we have to push for, for, a, for a civic organization to, to gain strength and a civil society to, to be created. There's a more detailed discussion of the Constitution in my speech, and, and, and you can have a copy of it, but I would rather ha give, leave, leave uh, some more time for, for an exchange see, see, and answer your questions. And the uh, Constitution of Afghanistan for the first time obligated uh, Afghanistan to, to obey to the international norms and uh, the convention that Afghanistan is a part of. Of course, these, most of these, all of these conventions are much more liberal than, than the Afghan laws are there. So this is, although it's a minor uh, article in Afghanistan, but it could, it could be used in a very positive way to push for human rights and also to push for adherence to the international conventions. The Afghan constitution is just another example that Afghanistan have come a long way in, in two short years. The fact that in Berlin we have received 4.5 billion for our next fiscal year, and that was exactly the amount that we were asking for, indicates that, that the international community, the European community, the United States, have uh, a large degree of assurance that our vision and our plan will work for the future. Uh, today, Afghanistan is emerging as a model, gradually. The, the Afghan constitution, as I mentioned, it, it's, it's a document that will be a source of inspiration for many other countries, many other places. When, when I saw the, the, the draft of the uh, provisional constitution for Iraq and, and I realized that they are requiring for a 25% quota for women, then I was thinking of having our constitutional commission uh, sue them for copyright violations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but this is good news, so we're not going to do it. So. Um, we, we are hoping that uh, the commerce is taking root in Afghanistan and we see the future of Afghanistan in uh, the neighboring countries, Pakistan, Iran, and others, in, in, in commerce. Our trade, with, despite difficulties that we have with, with Pakistan uh, on fighting uh, terrorism, our trade with Pakistan was close to half a billion dollars, the official figure. The unofficial could be close to a billion. So we really emphasize on, 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 bu on building the, 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 the regional relations around trade and commerce. 
And that's why we put a lot of emphasis on, on, on building the infrastructures in Afghanistan, the roads. And as you know, the road from Kabul to Kandahar is completed. And we have, we have secured funding for 5,000 kilometers of the ring road and other connecting roads to the neighboring countries. And the construction for all these roads are underway. The Kabul Bamiyan roads being built with the assistance of uh, Italian. Kabul Kandahar is completed with the assistance of Japan, uh, United States, and Saudi Arabia. Kandahar Herat is underway. Herat Spinbul Lake is completed. I'm sorry, Erat Islam Kala is completed and Kandahar Spinbul Lake is underway. Kabul Jalalabad first, first phase has been completed. So it's go on. And it, this is for us very important. It's the roads uh, for us is important because first it, it reconnects the region through Afghanistan and then also provide, enhance the, the national unity. It provides for, for connection to people. The, the, the trip from Kandahar to Kabul used to take 24 hours. Now it's only four hours. So this is a big enhancement for trade, for security, for, for interaction among people. And we push for that. Initially, when, when I started, I came for about two years ago here, uh, meeting some officials in Washington. People were, were, were not sure if the rules are really a great project, if this was a real um, priority for Afghanistan. And it turned out that it is. And, and still, we, are, we will we continue pushing on that, because we have to create the infrastructure for the, for the private sector to move in. We see the private sector at the end of the day is the real engine of the growth in Afghanistan. But we have to provide that. <coughs> We just uh, hosted the, an, an, an ECO conference in, uh, in Kabul. Actually, it's going on yesterday and today. Uh, ten countries got together. This is the first international conference in Kabul after, after, the, after the changes in, in Afghanistan. And um, Hyatt Hotel is investing in Afghanistan again. The groundbreaking was like a week ago. They're investing for $40 million mobile phone companies. Have invested in so the, the prospects of investment in Afghanistan is really bright. We had a an economic growth rate of 30% last year. And we would like to maintain this at 20% this year. And over long range of 10 years, we would like to keep it at 9%. That's the only way that will enable us to keep the legal economy stronger than the drug economy in Afghanistan. Uh, on the financial policies, we, from very early on, we came, up, we came out with the National Development Framework we, we, we ask the international community what our priorities are and, and where we wanted the money to be spent. And again, the document that was produced in Berlin is securing Afghanistan future. It's an outstanding document for any other post-conflict countries. It basically, it's a close to 100-page document. It basically says what we need and where we're going to spend again and why we need it. So it's important for us to build the capacity of the government to deliver services, but also to, to be on the driving seat when it comes to using the, the resources. Of course, we cannot do this completely because of lack of human resources in Afghanistan. We have introduced a new currency, and um, the, the exchange rate stayed stable since the, the new currency was introduced. And we did it in a matter of three months. I was in a meeting with Mr. Koizomo uh, in Japan when, uh, when, when President Karzai discussed our plan. They, they couldn't believe it that something like that could be done in three months. And we did it. We did it using using helicopters, cars, donkeys, everything to get this money to different parts of the country. And with no security incident whatsoever. And uh, we, we've collected um, 17 trillion, worth of 17 trillion Afghani in currencies and burned them and exchanged them with the new currency. So, uh, uh, and then again, a lot of discussion about security issues for the election. The, 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 election, the election for the uh, lawyer Jerga, the constitutional lawyer Jerga about four months ago when it took place, no, no, in December actually, it took place with no incident. The problem of the election in Afghanistan is not going to be so much of a security problem. It's going to be a logistical problem on how to reach the people. And we can, we can discuss about that if, if needed. Basically, after years of three-digit inflation, right now we, we are experiencing an, an inflation-free environment for business and investment in Afghanistan. In one of the programs that Afghanistan have introduced, and it's been, it's been a small program, but, but successful, is the National Solidarity Program. A very basic concept of, of lending $20,000 to each village throughout the country. Each village. Every village in Afghanistan will get $20,000. They get to elect their, 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 their development councils, and those councils will set the priorities on how the money should be used. This is a good exercise because it gives the ownership to the people, and also it's a good exercise in democracy. And, and, and 
and proper management. Unfortunately, the, implement the implementing part has to be done by NGOs and others because the resources are not there. I, I, I hope that that will also develop. We continue to face security challenges of two natures. At the south, basically terrorist infiltration, most of them of cross-border nature. At the north, internal fighting between different militias and groups. And um, to overcome these challenges, we have to build our national institutions. And we have, we have to, unfortunately, we have to continue to seek uh, external support on the security sector. We have just, we are, we are, we are um, reforming our national um, security directorate, uh, which is a leftover of the Soviet-style organization. It, it, on the book, it implies 35,000 people. Uh, reality is probably not the case, but um, basically what we are facing is, is, is not only the problem of, of narcotics, warlords, but also a, a, a Soviet mindset among our bureaucrats. It's also, also a, a, a men lack of ethics and a mentality of, 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 of and that, that's, that's unfortunately a leftover of, of the war and violence of the past 10 years. As I mentioned, education is our highest priority. 5.6 million children are going back to school, largest number ever in the history of Afghanistan. Close to 30% are, are women, particularly on the lower grade. Um, but still, uh, we, we need to build 2,500 schools. United States is building 1,000 1, in the past for the next two years or so. Japan has just rebuilt 150 schools. Today, only 29% of schools in Afghanistan has a roof on it, and 70% of them needs major repair. Most of the schools, when you go in Afghanistan, the countrysides are held under a tent or just on, 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 the, on plain air. Kids are sitting, but, but the determination is there. People are really determined that I just to give, I was in Kabul back in September of last year that the terrorists burned a small school in, in Mughal Khil, close to Logar. And um, the school consisted of a tent. That's, that, that was it. The school was a tent. And the next day, um, there was a, a photo taken by AFP that might be still online. All the kids, all the little girls came to the school, showed up, and they were sitting next to this burned out tent, next to the ashes of the tent, and it insisted on continuing with their, with their, with their education. This is, the, this is the determination and the mentality of the Afghan people. They really, they know what, what it means to suffer in a war and violence and anarchy. They are very determined to make sure that the country does not go back to the days that it was. We face a lot of challenges. I am frank about it. We face the challenges of building a nation while starting from scratch, while Everything was destroyed in Afghanistan. Lack of, as I mentioned, lack of human capital is one of the most important things. We, funding equipment and all this could be imported, but human capital and skills cannot be imported. And if you import it from outside, it's extremely expensive. It could be ineffective. You have to build it in Afghanistan. Um, we have to we have to improve local and district local uh, governance. We we don't have the means to reach every part of Afghanistan to deliver services to them. And by by we are not able because we don't have the resources, we don't have the car, we don't have the equipment, and we don't have also the qualified people. We know that uh, in many district administrator, uh, even governors, are qual people who are not qualified to do this job. But it's hard to find someone to replace them. Even if politically you are able to remove that person, a really qualified person to do this job is very hard to get. Lack of human capital in Afghanistan is tremendous. I am here at the embassy, while I have a strong and large Afghan community, it's hard for me to find someone to work at the embassy because the Afghans who are successful were making a lot more money. They're not going to be working for $1,000 or $2,000 a month that I am paying them at the embassy. It's, it's tremendous. Or they have the skills, they're successful in what they're doing, but they lack the skills that I need at the embassy. It takes time. And, and, and that's why, for us, managing the expectation of the people is, it was one of the most difficult task because when, when people hear that Afghan in Kabul in Afghanistan, when people hear that four billion dollar has been allocated to Afghanistan for the f next fiscal year, they divide it by the population and they think that everyone will get something out of it and they, and they come and ask us where is my money <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's what the case is and that's why you, 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 a lot of in, in many instances you see complaint and, and people are entitled of, of course we have also we have not been able to deliver what we were supposed to because of lack of resources and particularly lack of human capital, and also some political problems.
As I mentioned, all Afghans have not benefited from peace dividend. We know that. And uh, we must eliminate in Afghanistan corruption. It's connected to drugs. We must eliminate in Afghanistan nepotism. This is a problem. This undermine our recovery process. And we must eliminate the rule of gun. The, the clashes in Iraq and Faryab once again prove that we are not going to be able to build a civil society in Afghanistan as long as private militias and, and rule of Ghan and mentality of Ghan is there. And that could be only done by helping Afghans build the national institutions once and also providing, providing for the short term and the security that we need from external sources. In addition to the general challenges that we are facing to build the nation, now we are facing specific challenges of implementing our new constitution, while our judges and our attorneys are making $40 a month. And while our, our people do not have any electoral experience, while political parties, in most instances for Afghan men, Tanzim, that was created in Pakistan, that basically a military organization formed around a personality or an ethnic affiliation. We have, to, we have to introduce and help people come up with national visions, parties with a, with a vision, make people to come out of their small valley, of their small village, see the beautiful country that's out there. And that takes time again. It, these things cannot be done by, by, by decree. And uh, we are looking forward <coughs> to the expansion of ISAF and PRTs. PRTs are, right now we have 12 PRTs operational. We are hoping to have 16 by, by the election. They are doing a, a tremendously good job. I know some, some NGOs uh, don't like them, but, but I think over the long run, they, they, they will prove themselves to be beneficial. And they have done it so, so far. And the most important thing is, is to accelerate the process of, of uh, DDR, demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration of the militias in Afghanistan. And President Karzai introduced a new plan that by June of this year, then, uh, at least 40,000 people will be demobilized. Again, so far the demobilization process has been a voluntary process, like sending a cart there, warlord, please disarm. So there's so much that you can expect from that, that, that process. It has, to, it has to have some muscle into it, and that could be only provided by the international community. And as I mentioned, there's no way to build a civil society in Afghanistan as long as the culture of Afghan and the warlords are there. Uh, narcotics, I'm just, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna end with that. Narcotics is a serious challenge for us. We see direct connection between narcotics, terrorism, and warlords. They feed each other. The money, the, mo the money that that's came from the proceeds of the sale of drugs, which sells for 100 times more than the, the, the farm gate price in Europe and other places, is used to finance terrorism, criminal element throughout Asia and Europe, and also finance the destabilizing activities of warlords in Afghanistan. For us, it's to our best, it's to our national interest to fight narcotics. And, but there's so much that we can do. What we are asking for is we have to mobilize every available resources, ours and, and that of international community to fight that, including military assets if needed, to go after uh, uh, labs in Afghanistan, labs that produce heroin and others. We have come up with a national um, drug strategy, but again, the implementation is the most important part of it. It should it, it, it include a law enforcement component, uh, an alternative livelihood, but overall, it has the fight against narcotics in Afghanistan should be seen as a, in the context of fighting terrorism. Otherwise, it will not work. If we make, say, UK in charge of it and allocate $50 million, it's not going to work. It has to be a comprehensive plan that every available asset in Afghanistan should be mobilized against it. Otherwise, it will criminalize our economy. And it, to some degree, it already has. Again, um, to overcome all these challenges, the Afghan people needs and demand the cooperation of the international community. And, uh, and um, the sooner and the more this, uh, uh, this um, this uh, cooperation and this assistance are delivered to Afghanistan, it's, the less expensive it will be. It will cost more. Look at our fight against narcotics. Slow action have, have uh, had a very costly consequences for all of us, for Afghan government, for the international community, for everyone. So we, we would like to see a, a larger degree of, of, of investment in the partnership with the Afghan people. What 
what we are asking for, what we are looking for, is a partnership with the international community to make Afghanistan a safer place and therefore the world. We are giving handouts. It's not going to help in Afghanistan. We, the international community, has spent $2 billion the past two years to prevent humanitarian emergencies in Afghanistan. We will be sending more than that if you don't build the national institutions in Afghanistan. It's just I'll end with that saying that our people really believe in engagement with the international community. And uh, the leadership of the Afghan government, President Karzai, has proven to be a, a, a viable partner for the international community. We should make sure that, that people of Afghanistan don't feel that, that this trust is misplaced. Thank you. Well, we'll open the floor for questions now. The gentleman in the front, could we pass the microphone down, please? Wilson, thank you. I'm Al Milliken, affiliated with Washington Independent Writers. Since you named Islam in the Afghanistan Constitution, um, in writing and then implementing the Constitution, what input did you get from other Islamic nations? Uh, did you hear from Turkey? Did you hear from nations where Sharia Islamic law is being implemented? And what role did Pakistan play? A number of the um, scholars who were involved in drafting the Constitution in Afghanistan were trained in Egypt which historically provided a good example of, uh, of combining the, the civil law system, uh, which basically is a French system, and the Islamic laws. Um, uh, and uh, the content of the Afghan constitution, of course, does not push for a secular system as the uh, constitution of Turkey. Pakistan constitution has been modified many times. This be the, and, and, and it was modified a different condition and situations. Uh, we did seek input from from uh, experts uh, from the uh, from from Islamic countries. We particularly we looked into the models, and actually our experts were trained in Egyptian model more or less, because we do in Afghanistan we do have a civil law system. We we have a, a civil code, a penal code, a commerce code, a, a codified system like that of a Fr of a France. Therefore, in, in many instances, the need for 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 application of Sharia rarely arise because in any in a given matter, there is a law on the book that could be implemented and is implemented. We are revising some of these. The Afghan uh, penal code is being revised with the consultation of some, uh, some legal experts here in the United States. Thank you. Awesome. Um, my name is uh, Malala Bolte. You want to wait till we get the microphone? Uh, my name is uh, Malalai Bolpi. I'm with Af um, U.S. Afghanistan Reconstruction Council. It's a, a nonprofit NGO that's based in Washington and also in Kabul. Um, I just wanted to tell, uh, tell the ambassador that he said something very fundamental that uh, stands in the face of proponents of parliamentary system in Afghanistan, and that is the void of a legitimate leadership uh, within the regions. Um, I think that it, it's a misconception on the part of international community to uh, recognize these figures as representatives of their culture. Um, in fact, I think that some of the anti-terrorism policy, especially from the United States, actually empowers these, these very powers that prevent the immersion of legitimate grassroots um, regional leadership in Afghanistan that could one day support a parliamentary system. And meanwhile, I mean, I have noticed in my work that there is real reluctance to build the institutions of Afghanistan, the legitimate government institutions of Afghanistan, because of um, accusations of corruption, and a lot of that uh, has been, in my experience, has shown that it's because of lack of resources. Um, we have individuals that are extremely talented, that, are, um, that have the credentials, and they're running a government without any resources. So yes, that definitely gives rise to corruption. Um, so it's, it seems like the chicken and the egg, we won't empower these institutions, we won't build them because there's corruption, but there's going to be corruption if there's no resources. That's one of the things. And, um, I mean, that, that was just a comment I wanted to make. And also, my assessment is that um, some of the issues that we're having with lord, warlords in the regions and their power in the regions, um, it could be addressed with some funding, that, some funding that matches the incentive that these warlords uh, provide to, to their militia. It's not that much. I mean, the US Army right now, they're getting paid $60 a month. 
and a warlord can afford to pay them a lot more than that. Um, is, is, this, is this something that you can agree with? Is there anything else that, um, what is your opinion on what would some take, disempower some of these warlords in the regions? Because they're not ideal, they're not cultural ideals, they're not icons. They're there by force and they're there because they can pay. So I, I want to know what your opinion would be on um, disempowering them aside from uh, you know, giving them money to help us in the war against terrorism. You're absolutely right. If, if we provide for, for better opportunity for people to have a decent, a dignified life, nobody want to kill or get killed for someone else if he has another option to have a dignified life. Even, even the, uh, every member of those militias, they're people like you and me. They want to have a decent life. They want to have their kids to go to school. But they have no other options. They have first lack of education. Then also the only thing that they know that is, is the Kalashnikov that they had for the past 30 years. So if they give them an, an alternative, they will certainly take it. Uh, but of course, along with the, with the alternative, it ha the skills should be there. When we, when we were building the Afghan National, National Army initially, we asked some uh, groups and some people to send in volunteers from different parts of the country. And um, people were coming with the militia mentality. They were thinking that working in the Afghan National Army means learning some English, hanging out with <coughs> Americans, and, and just, just, just having fun and getting paid uh, 60 or $70 a month. Once they, they, they enrolled, they came in, and, they, and the training started, they said, they realized, no, that, that's tough. That, that's really, this is an army here. They're talking serious. Some of them left. That's why you see a lot of reports on the media that, that people, any members are leaving. They're leaving for two reasons. First, they, ca they, they cannot take the discipline. They're not used to it. It's, they, they were fighters for 20 years, but, but fighters, uh, that, that they fight they, they, when they like it. There was no discipline. And then, then also, we, we are paying them 60 or $70, $70 exactly a month, which was a good salary when we started two years ago. But today, with the, with the economic growth on the market, they can make much more than that. They can make, when, when I went back to Kabul, making a dollar a day was a good salary. Now they're making up to five dollars. So, and, but, th but that, the amount that we are paying to the members of the Afghan National Army has not changed. So that's why they're leaving. And same thing is true. If, if there are other alternatives for the people, they will, they will certainly, but they have to be, that's why it's part of the disarmament program that has to be a component of, of, of giving them some kind of skills, not only money for the gun. So, so they can use that skills to, to have a, 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 a dignified life. I wonder if I might ask a, a double-barreled question. I wonder if you could elaborate. You alluded to the difficulty in establishing political parties, and then you talked about the past practice, and I wonder if you could elaborate on that. And also, the one thing that has struck me, one of the, the real problems, and I don't know how one gets at it, is the, the difficulty of the, of the central government to collect taxes to generate revenues dependent, uh, I guess at present it's largely dependent upon contributions from the warlords, from Ishmael Khan, and, and when do you see, what point does that all change? Um, on the political parties, um, yeah, as I mentioned, the, the past history is, is painful. When, when I was the chief of staff of President Karzai, and we were preparing for for the lawyer Jerga in election others. We, we debated, we discussed the issues of forming a political party for the president because I, I wanted to be reelected. Um, but the, 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 the issue is that he can carry a lot more weight as a national leader right now than being a leader of a political party because the leader of a political party in Afghanistan is right now conceived as being someone operating bit more or less on a factional agenda, not a national agenda. So the, the, the past uh, experiences, the past history is for us, is, is painful and it will probably slow down the formation of real political parties. The secular political parties that were formed in the cities, the left parties and others, they went to an extreme and they antagonized the people too. Uh, many of the, of the, um, of the extreme right and left parties were not uh, around ethnic affiliations. The communist or, 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 or Hezbi Islami, for instance, has members from different ethnic. Hezbi Islami later on actually acquired this identity of operating based on ethnicity. Initially, they, they were against ethnicity and, and they, 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 their members were from, from many ethnic groups. Uh, the, of, yes, this is a problem. That, that for the, the, the problem in Afghanistan is, the good news in Afghanistan is that 
moderate and moderation is in majority in Afghanistan. The bad news is that these are very unorganized. A question was raised by a gentleman over there, I think, about some why the oh, but the, why some of the, the fundamentalist group and parties are lingering, because because they were the only one that that have access to organization in the past years during the jihad in the 70s and 80s. They, they acquire the tools, the skills, and the money to be, to be mobilized and organized, and and others didn't have. And and, and so that the, the experience of the of the resistance parties uh, help some of the uh, some of the fundamentalist group right now to to use the same tools, the same the same organization that existed before. They are more experienced in in, in, in how to mobilize people and how to organize people. Uh, on the question of taxes, it's two things. One is is, is the na building national institutions to really exactly to know ex how much, if, if we know exactly how much Ismail Khan or, 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 or Gulagash Irzoi in the past were collecting from Kandahar or Iraq, we would have been in a better position to ask him, look, you're getting $1 million a day, where is it? Because of the lack of the institution, we, we don't have that number yet. And this is one problem. Of course, they are resisting, they're keeping this, this, the, 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 the national revenue for their own, and they, this is against the African con Constitution. But on the other hand, we also, we don't have the, the necessary capability and the capacity to know exactly how much it is, and also to, to, to uh, the national institution is not that strong that, that if you send someone in there, then he will do a perfect job of sending all the revenues back to Kabul. It, it will, it will uh, in order to overcome uh, first the political issues of the to, to finish the rule of, of this, to, to implement the rule of law in Afghanistan and implement the constitution of Afghanistan. That's one thing, and then uh, on, in addition to that, to, to build the national institutions for us to, to monitor and collect the revenues. Please. Uh, you're speaking to the mic. Bring me the mic. Roy Gutman of USIP and uh, Newsweek. Um, could you just bring us up to date on the security issues in the north and in uh, the west? I mean, who's, uh, who, who, especially in, in Herat, what is the role of the international community? How do you see the outcome? Uh, and then also the same in the north. Well, after we, we have, we have sent about 1,500 ANA Afghan National Army soldiers in, in, in Herat, so that the, the situation is, is calm. That's, that's, for, that's, that's for sure. Um, Ismail Khan has been in consultation with the Afghan government. He's coming to Kabul. Uh, the situation in Faryab developed after uh, Dostum sent his troop um, to, to the province, uh, to the center of the province. And he had retreated his troop back. And, and, and uh, um, the situation is calm and stable at this point. Uh, and um, we, will, we will have to see what kind of measure will be taken in, in the future, particularly in, in Faryab, where the governor is not, is not back in the, in the province. So and, and he has to, uh, has to go back and reinstall. And what was the role of the international community? How did they assist in this, uh, bringing into this supposed stability? Um, they could have played a more, a more positive role on that. Some of the statements that were made were damaging, like saying, we will not get involved. This is an internal matter. It is not. It's part of the building national institutions and in enhancing security in Afghanistan. And it's not an internal matter. It is. Uh, that's that's why that, that's my my personal position and opinion. <coughs> they could have played a, a, a bigger role, and they should. As I mentioned, they should. You've indicated a certain degree of skepticism about political parties, but you went on to talk about the fact that the moderates are not mobilized. And when they're not mobilized, it's the extremist parties. And certainly that's been the history of the country. And you also said that, in effect, the president wants to be above the fray. Well, I wonder whether you can have all of those things. Uh, because unless you have and encourage political parties, and perhaps ideally even give them more time to organize than this election is doing, Unless you have that, obviously the advantage is going to lie with the extremist parties. And unless the president is willing to play a role in this mobilization of the moderates, how can he possibly expect to work together 
with a legislative body which, in which he will have no ability uh, because they're, they're not sharing an affiliation. He will have no ability, it seems to me, to really effectively influence. So that, at its best, the political party is a vehicle here by which the executive is able to work cooperatively through discipline with the parliament. But if he absents himself from that, where then does he go above the parliament? Does he reach out to the people? Where, how then can he be effective in public policy? Yeah, this is a, it's a very good question. And, it, and it, it's not only a question, it's also a concern for people who are really interested to, to, to see democracy and rule of law flourish in Afghanistan. Uh, at this point, he is, uh, President's intention is to reach to the people because uh, it, might, it might be something difficult to do. Uh, uh, but the fact is that, that, that those uh, extremists who have organizations, they, they are away from the people. They are small in number but very effective. The moderates are large in number but rather ineffective because of lack of organization. So the, 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 the objective right now is to, to keep <coughs> President Karzai as is a, is a leader above political parties and to reach directly the people, the people of Afghanistan, who are mostly, all of them actually are unorganized and are and at least not organized in political parties. Uh, but again, I, I understand this is, this is, this is a difficult uh, exercise to achieve, but nothing has been really easy in Afghanistan. We have to, as I mentioned, we are, we are balancing different things at the same time. So we have to, uh, and, and, and that's why I, I started my speech by saying that our objective in the past two years were to, to maintain stability and, and to really to keep everybody intent as much as possible. And, uh, uh, but, but I completely understand uh, your, 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 your concerns, your points, and, and this, is, this is the advice that was, has been given for, for by, by many other friends of Afghanistan that in order to really to have, a, we should have a long-term plan of and start working and mobilizing the moderates. I think they should be done, but it's, it should, I abs I, there's, no, there's no question that the moderates in Afghanistan needs to be organized and the international uh, community can play some, some limited role in that because they're, uh, they're constitutional uh, constraint on uh, how much could be done on that. Uh, but it, if it probably it's better if it's done without the president's involvement and still keep the president as, as a national <coughs> leader above this, above, above this kind, of, kind of. But again, we're, this, is it, I, I, this is a debate that's going on. Ben? Mr. Ambassador, Ben Fitzgerald. Could you talk a little bit more about the roles of both Iran and Pakistan? Because on, on the one side, there's ostensibly very cordial official relationships, and yet both governments appear to be involved in a very duplicitous game uh, with their proxies internally. Uh, could you discuss that and, and uh, what the prospects uh, are? Despite the fact that we are a member of a coalition and, and a very close friend and ally of the United States, our relations with Iran has been cordial, particularly with the reform-minded wing of the government in Iran. Um, Iran has their own internal issues. They, there are multiplicity of, 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 of power uh, structures and, and points, and um, sometimes, um, some of these groups, some of the elements, might not be as cooperative as President Khatami has, is actually in his relation with Afghanistan. Um, there's a good relation and understanding at the top level between President Karzai and President Khatami, and, and they meet rather regularly. Um, and Iran has been uh, very cooperative and forward coming in, in, in the rebuilding of Afghanistan. They have they are building roads, they are involved in many projects, and even the private sector, or the Iranian private sector, is also taking a large uh, role in Afghanistan and seeing this as an opportunity. Pakistan, we, we have no option but to have the best relation with Pakistan. <laughs> and um, uh, we, see the, we see the future of the country, we see our future, the future of the region in trade, in good relations with Pakistan. 
from our experiences in Afghanistan, other countries in the region, we know that there is no way that anyone can use extremism as a selective tool of policy. <laughs> it will, it will come back and hunt everybody in the region at home and anywhere. Um, we really welcome the degree of the cooperation that Pakistan is increasingly providing, but more can be done. There's no doubt about that. Much more could be done, and it's to the best national interest of Pakistan and Afghanistan to do more. Um, and um, that's all, I think. <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot. John, no, no, you already did that. That's right. <laughs> we have time just for one more question. Deepa? Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, Deepa Olafle from GW. Uh, you mentioned that commerce and trade were what you saw as the as a way of building relationships in the region, and uh, this is to extend further that. Uh, of course, Afghanistan's mo uh, its, it's attractiveness lies in the fact that it is such a <coughs> transit route, and so then it brings the question of the natural gas pipelines as a possibility. And I'd like to know what the current thinking is in Afghanistan about the prospects of that. And um, to that extent, of course, Pakistan becomes very important, as does the Indian market, which makes it economically viable. But how do you see the fact that, because given the fractious relationship between India and Pakistan, do you see the, um, do you see a way around <coughs> this in, that would benefit not just Afghanistan, but a more regional uh, market? Yeah, the, the pipeline that that's supposed to be constructed from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way to India, is is a very attractive project for us. If constructed, Afghanistan will receive about $150 million transit fee. I, I'm familiar with this project because at one point I went to Turkmenistan to negotiate the terms. And we are, we are enthusiastic. We really want this project to take place, and so is Turkmenistan very much, because they want and they need an outlet to the south. They're, they're extremely interested in this project. Uh, but this project will be feasible, to tell you the truth, if, uh, if we get some major oil company interested to finance it, because we're talking about more than a billion dollar investment. And uh, this magnitude of investment will be made only if, if they, the, the people are, are, are assured that the end market, which is India, is willing to buy this. So any kind of improvement between the relation between Pakistan and India will help tremendously us. This is, again, another example that we really are pushing for openness at the regional level, because we will benefit from, from better relation, from, from less tension between India and Pakistan, from better relation between any country, Central Asian republics, will we benefit tremendously if they open up their, their borders further. Uh, the end market for that, uh, for, the, for the pipeline and the gas, is basically India, because Pakistan, in particular, in CV, has plenty of, a lot, enough gas for now, at least. So if, if, if and I don't think that if, if the relations improve, then there will be no concern of giving like a choke point to, to, to Pakistan. Uh, and, and we hope that, that, that with the improvement of the relations in, between Pakistan and India, that project will be, will be viable and implemented. For us, well, we, the arrangement is that we not only get transit fees, but we can also pump in or out gas if, if we need it. So the, the way the agreement is, is, is worked out is, is tremendously advantageous to Afghanistan. Well, all right, we'll take one more, one final question. Final, final. <coughs> we have the mic. Well, maybe we try without the mic. Oh. No. Here we are talking about, I'm Majid Khan from the University of Maryland. Here we are talking about the democracy, and the democracy needs always needs a liberal society. And as you mentioned in your speech that you have a very conservative society. So, like, and all the time culture and society will dictate who comes to whom. How, how you see that in future that there will be, you know, separation between the mosque and state? Well, we, we should not just pick a one aspect of, of democracy. <coughs> democracy and the rule of law is, is much more than that. And, and a lot of um, traditional societies have a lot of um, values that, that enhance the spirit of free market, for instance, like the, in Afghanistan, or other values that help the establishment of, of, of democracy in a society. We, uh, that we, for us, it's important to have a gradual approach 
uh, we don't, uh, as the Afghan constitution shows, we don't see any contradiction between, between, uh, for instance, Islam and, and democracy. It, if it's if it's used uh, properly in a, in a gradual manner, there are a lot of values that could be uh, mutually reinforcing. Um, uh, we see the future of of our country, of the region, in democracy and free market economy. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the meantime, uh, we are using the traditional institutions to, to, to further enhance uh, the, the establishment and the strengthen of, of democratic rule. Well, I think uh, with that, we draw to a close to this keynote part of the address. I hope you'll join me in thanking the ambassador. Thank and Bob has a word to say to instructions for us. Uh, well, thank you, Dennis, for your customarily good job. Mr. Ambassador, I believe this is your first visit to the Wilson Center. We trust it will not be your last. Thank you. Uh, we would like to invite you, if you're able to stay for a few minutes and talk and have some coffee and tea sure. outside. Um, as I indicated earlier, there is immediately out these two doors um, light refreshments. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum is going to get us started again in about 15 to 20 minutes, so don't stray. Uh, there, are also, there are also copies of the ambassador's written remarks outside.